We're going to continue tonight our study of the, of the providence of God, and we, I don't feel like we finished our discussion last week. We kind of ran through the end of it, and then there were some, uh, some questions that folks were asking at the end of class, and uh, so I wanted to be able to cover some of those things tonight just as a continuation of where we le- were last week. I think if we're, gonna, if we're going to try to understand the providence of God, I think we've got to understand the nature of God. And uh, if you want to know how God is, is busy and active and working in our lives, then I think we need to, to understand uh, who God is and, and how He is active in our lives. This has kind of been the, the summary that we have been using uh, to talk about the providence of God. Some of you haven't been here uh, this quarter, and so I, I don't want you to jump right into a study where you're not sure the direction we're headed. When we talk about God's providence, it is that He created everything, and yet that create, that the Creator is still sustaining everything. And that His support, His government, His preservation and care and supervision is still being exercised over His creation today uh, in order that His creation might fulfill the purpose for which it was created. Uh, and, God, and what we're saying by that is God had a purpose in His creation. He had a purpose uh, in, in everything that happened in those first six days. And He is still active and following through and helping those purposes to become a reality. God created us to bring glory to Him. God created us so that we might spend an eternity with Him. And God is still working to allow those things to come about. And tied directly to that is the idea of His nature. And we looked at all of these things last week. I'm not going to spend but maybe uh, just a few minutes in way of review. And then I want us to look at three questions uh, at the end of this as uh, based upon it. We looked at several key characteristics, several uh, qualities of God last week. First of all, the idea that God is eternal, that He always has existed, He always will exist. I think one of the key, uh, key uh, passages that says that, let me find it real quick here. I thought it was on the second slide. Uh, maybe it's on this slide. Uh, have you not known, it talks about the everlasting God, that He shall endure forever. I can't find the verses I was wanting. I like how it says he inhabits eternity, that his dwelling place is among all generations. Psalm 90 says that he is from everlasting to everlasting. Here's the passage I'm looking for in Isaiah 46. He says, For I am God, there's no other. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from from ancient times things that are not yet known. Our God is eternal and has been able to separate, uh, in his mind anyway, the end from the beginning before there ever was a beginning. And when God, you know, Katie asked me, I don't remember when it was, within the last week, she she asked me about how does God see time? That wasn't her exact question, but here's this little seven-year-old trying to figure out eternity, and here I am, I don't even understand eternity, and I'm trying to explain to her, you know, how God sees time. And that's that's confusing for a seven-year-old, and I don't think it gets any more clearer for us as we get older, that, that God, God looks at time completely different than we do. God looks at time, and, and, and it's not, it's not where in our finite minds, this is the present. And if you wait a few seconds, now this is the present, and what I said just a minute ago is now in the past, and what I'll say two seconds from now is now in the future. Okay, now it's in the present, and now it's in the past. You know, for us, time is forever moving. God looks at time, and God is eternal. How does, God know what we, how does God know what we were going to do before He ever created us? We'll talk about Him being omniscient, but it's because God is eternal. When God, when God looks down through time, and again, that's accommodative language, I think, for us to try to understand what he, how He sees things. But when God looks down through time, He is eternal. He was before there ever was a beginning, and He will be after there's ever an end, and when we use those words, again, accommodative language to the creation and the end of this world. But God has been able to declare the end from the beginning because He is that eternal, everlasting God. The other second quality we looked at is this idea of God being immutable. That God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's passages throughout the, uh, the Old and New Testaments they talk about that fact, and we're, this is one of the questions we're going to come back to. It's, at least it's, it's based off of this, so uh, understand these verses and try to grasp, grasp them as we go through. 
But this is one of the key passages in James chapter 1, where it says, With God there is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. God is not a God uh, who changes. In, uh, in, in Exodus chapter 3, he, he is the I am. He is the same. This is a quotation from Psalms that's found uh, in, I think it's from Psalms in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, and so that, that's, the, that's the, uh, the immutable God. You have an omnipotent God who is all-powerful. There's nothing uh, that God cannot do. Within the realm of, of things that can be done, God can do everything. He, he is an all-powerful, as he's called in the Bible, an almighty God, and there's nothing too hard. There's nothing that's impossible for God. Now, is that true? Oh, God cannot lie. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean he's immutable? Does that mean that, does that mean that he is not omnipotent? If he can't lie, does that reflect on his power? What does that say about the power of God? Oh, he's not very powerful because he can't lie. How do you explain that? I hear some... How, how do you explain that? How do you explain that God is all-powerful and yet Titus chapter 1 and verse 2 says he cannot do something. He cannot lie. Okay. God is sovereign. Uh, the comment that was made up here, God is, is pure. Uh, God chooses not to lie. Could, <laughs> Why is that? Why is, why is it that God cannot and is incapable of lying? How do you explain that from the stand? And, and I agree with you totally about everything you've said. How do you explain that from a standpoint that God's all powerful, but there's something he cannot do? He is incapable of anything that's evil or wrong. What does James chapter 1 say that he does not do? James 1 and verse 13. God does not tempt any man. What does that mean? If God, if God can, can do anything, why doesn't he do that? Kyle? I don't know, this is just maybe a different way to think about it. We're thinking of terms of he cannot lie and he's incapable of evil, but maybe a different way to look at it is we know that God spoke the world into existence, and maybe a better way to think about it is that whatever he says becomes true. I mean, he literally created the world When, when, when Jesus says, thy word is truth, what does that mean? That, that's his nature. His nature is truth. How do you violate your nature? How do you violate who you are? God, God, God is, and, and all of your comments are very good, and, and Kyle's basing his comments based upon some of the verses that are up here, that, that just by his words he spoke things into existence. And, and, and everything uh, that was created just by the, by the word of his power. There's nothing too hard uh, for you. This favorite passage of many from Ephesians chapter 3, uh, that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And with the all-powerful God, when you, talk, when you talk about the idea of providence, what is there in your life that you need to doubt that God is able to take care of? Sometimes in our minds we limit God, but to the power of God, He is omnipotent. There, there, is, no, there is no limit uh, that we need to place upon God. He's omniscient. Uh, he knows everything. And here, here's a passage we need to memorize from Romans chapter 11, that when you think about the wisdom and the knowledge of God, here needs to be our reaction. I can't even find the bottom of it. Oh, the depths of the riches of these, they're, un, they're unsearchable. You can't find the end of them. You can't find the bottom of them. You can't. They just keep going and going and going. There's nothing, there's nothing that can be known uh, that, that God does not know. And here, here's a lot of other passages. And we talked about this one uh, last week 
uh, from the book of Job, not only in the idea that God knows everything, but the, the idea that God is all-powerful in that conversation, at least the one-way conversation in many cases that God had with Job. The, the Lord is the God of knowledge. Here's one you need to know in, in Psalm 147. His, his understanding is infinite. There, there's no end to it. He knows the stars and their names. He knows the birds. He knows the number of the hairs on your head. He knows all men. He knows their future. The Bible says that God knows all things. He knows your thoughts. He knows what's coming to your mind. Every secret thing. He knows every hidden thing. There is no hidden thing because it's all known to God. And we won't look at this, but from Psalm 139, again, it talks about everything that God knows and the fact that there's nothing that God cannot know. And one of the questions we're going to look at in a minute is, just, is based on this too. Here's God. God knows everything. What does that mean for providence? What does that mean for God working in your life right now to fulfill His purposes? What, what, why is it a big deal that He know everything? He knows what we need even before we need it. B before we know it. Even before we need it, He knows what we need. So here's a God... Who, who knows, does he know who you are even before you are? Did, did he know Jeremiah before Jeremiah was Jeremiah? Uh, you know, here's, here's the Almighty God uh, who, who is omniscient. Here's the Almighty God who's omnipresent. What does that mean? What does omnipresent mean? He's everywhere. How, how do you explain that? How do you explain that God is everywhere? That, does that make sense to you? How do you explain that? If Katie asked me that tomorrow, how do I explain to a seven-year-old that God is everywhere? In fact, I think we even talked about this. We talked about, well, he's down in your room, he's in my room, he's here in the living room, and he's over in the church building. How does, how does he do that? He doesn't have a body. He's a spirit. Well, is the devil everywhere? Is the devil omnipresent? If the devil's omnipresent, then how can the Bible say, flee, uh, resist the devil, and he will flee from you? If he's going to flee, how is he omnipresent? He walks around like a roaring lion, hey. seeking those he can devour. He, he, he uh, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he, he may devour. Uh, Joe, did you say Matthew 4? Is that, what were you talking about? Did you say he left, he left Jesus for, for a time? And so, is there a difference between God and the devil? Just a little bit, right? Uh, just slightly. Here's God, and, and, and His very nature is the fact that he, that he exists everywhere. And we're going to come back and talk about this word in a minute. Uh, but His eyes run to and fro throughout all the earth. His eyes are in every place. Um, in Jeremiah, can anyone hide himself in secret places? Uh, and again, in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Wherever I go, guess what? That's where you are. God is om omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. There's three questions I want to ask. These are two questions, but they're really just one. Uh, this is where we ended last week, but we had to rush through it, and I wanted to come back to it. The fact that God is eternal, the fact that He's immutable, He doesn't change, the fact that He's omnip omnipotent, He's all-powerful, that He's all-knowing, that He's all-present. All of those are key facts that we need to understand when we talk about the providence of God. But if the answer to either of these questions on the screen is no, then do those facts really matter? If my God doesn't care about me, what difference does it make if He's omnipotent? If my God's not willing to help me in my life, what difference does it make if he's omniscient or omnipresent? You could have this almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God out there who doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Is that the God you serve? I mean, every, he's eternal, immutable, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. All true and, and all incredible facts about God, aren't they? I mean, they're facts that, that our little puny minds can't even comprehend. I mean, we, we sit here trying to, to come up with, with finite terms to describe, you know, the power of God and what He can and cannot do. We, we try to come up with, with, with terms that, that can appease our minds as to what He knows and doesn't know and how can He know it, you know. We try to think about 
and we can't even fathom. But there's five facts that are wonderful, but if he doesn't care about me, and if he's not willing to help me, that's all they are, are facts. And, and we could put up here, and I almost did, the, if you want to continue these omni, omni, omnis, all, all these things, is he an all-loving God or not? Is he an all-benevolent, all-caring God or not? Now, I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute. Is he all-loving? Does he love sin? Well, then he can't be all-loving. Uh, is he all-caring? You know, and, 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 we'll, and we'll come up with a reason that, that that can't be. And so that's why I didn't put him up there, because I knew we would fight about him for the rest of class. And I don't have time for that. So you can just think, but is it true? Is there anyone who's going to love you more than God? Anybody going to care about you more than God? Anybody going to be more benevolent and take care of you more than God? Does he care? Is he willing to help? Here's all of these things, but time's not the issue with God. Seasons aren't an issue with God. Having abilities not. Having knowledge is not. Being too busy, that's not, that's not the issue with God. The issue we need to come down to is does he care about us and, and is he willing to provide for us? Here's some verses. Is he full of compassion? What does that mean if he's full? You can't get anybody more compassionate than God. He's full uh, of compassion. All of his ways are of mercy and truth. He's full of compassion. He's gracious. Aren't you glad? He's long-suffering. Aren't you glad? He's abundant in mercy and truth. Aren't you glad? He's long-suffering to us. He's not willing that any should perish. God is love. And uh, the rest of the passage that June was quoting, or the verse before it, uh, where it talks about Satan walking about, verse 7 says about God, we need to cast all of our cares upon Him because He's the one who cares for us. Here's a verse you might know about God loving us, God demonstrating His love for us. What shall we say then if God is for us? Who can be against us? He didn't even spare His own Son. And yet here we are full of sin, and God freely gave to us... Uh, was that the end of that slide? I thought I had one more slide. God freely gave to us all things. So when I, when I serve God, I'm serving an eternal, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who is willing to do whatever I need in my life to get to heaven. Is that statement true? Is God willing to do anything in my life to help me get to heaven? Did God create me for a purpose? To bring glory to Him? to serve Him, and to get to heaven. Is God going to help me get there? Is, is the church a part of the providence of God? Are brothers and sisters in Christ a part of the providence of God? Um, you know, you look back in your life, some, some of you, um, some of you are, are transplants to this area. You're not natives, most of you. Let's see, John, you're a native, except you left but the prodigal has returned. Uh, so, you know, there, there's not many people that are, you know, most of you are transplants to this area. Why'd you come here? Because it's warm. Because it's warm. Water. Is it possible that the providence of God was involved in you coming to this area? Do you think the providence of God was involved with Joe and Mary and Holland moving here so that Joe Holland could be an elder in this church? But that wasn't why Joe moved here, I don't think. Was it, Joe, to be an elder in this church? No. Do you think the providence of God was working? Do you think the providence of God was, was working to, to uh, get Hector and Amanda together? I mean, who would ever marry this guy? I mean, providence of God, ha <laughs> God had to be working in this. Surely, surely somewhere was the providence of God working when, when Beth Pittman goes to Freed Hardeman and gets, you know, eventually her MRS degree for, from being there? Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to pinpoint where the providence of God is working where it's not, isn't it? But is God working in our lives or isn't He? It, it, does He care about us and is He working to help us get to heaven? When a Christian marries, when a faithful Christian marries a faithful Christian, is that a step to help you get to heaven? Yes. Is God not helping those things to come up. It, does it mean that God's forcing you to marry that person? 
Does it mean that God forced Beth to go to Freed Hardeman and she didn't have a choice? That's one of the questions we're going to ask in a minute. Here's the question that was asked at the end of class, and I wish the person who asked it was here tonight, uh, but we'll answer it anyway, and they can watch the DVD later. Does God ever change his mind? We talked about, here's one of his qualities. He's immutable. He doesn't change. Is that one of his qualities? Does he change his mind? Is the Bible contradictory when it suggests that God is immutable, and then it shows instances when God, quote, changed his mind? Get your, get your Bibles and look in, ex, in the book of Exodus. We know Malachi chapter 3 says that I, I am the Lord, I do not change. And then you get to uh, the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 32. And uh, this is, I should have put it up there, but that's the New American Standard quotation in Exodus 32 there. Um, when we get there, as somebody who's got the King James, I'm going to ask you what the King James says. And then I've got the New King James. Exodus chapter 32, what's the story? If you don't know, you probably got a chapter hitting. Story in Exodus 32 is what? The golden calf. Where is Moses in Exodus 32? He's on the mountain. What's happening with Moses on the mountain? All right. He's on the mountain and the Lord is giving to him the law. What's happening down below? Anarchy is one word. Uh, idolatry is another word. Um, sin is another word. There, there's a lot of words you can use for what's happening down there. But we, want, we, uh, we come to this in verse 4. Um, they received the gold in their hand, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and they made a golden calf. And then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Um, verse 7. Here's God's reaction. Go get down, talking to Moses. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and they sacrificed to it. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and, my, and I may consume them and I will make you a great nation. What's God's reaction to this golden calf deal? Uh, is he angry? He says to Moses, you go down there. They have made this molded calf. This is a stiff-necked people. My wrath may, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume or destroy them. Verse 11. Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm of your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self. And you said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So, verse 14, the New King James says, the Lord relented. What does the King James say? The Lord repented. The New, the New American Standard says, the Lord changed his mind from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Is God immutable? Does God change or not change? Did God change? Don't answer this. We're going to answer it in a minute. Did God change in this instance or not? Uh, he, one translation says he repented. This says he relented. This says he changed his mind. And yet I read everywhere else in the Bible, I am the Lord, I do not change. How do you justify those two statements? Two more. Numbers chapter 23 says God's not a son of man. Uh, that he should repent. But you go back to Genesis chapter 6, and when every thought and intent of the heart of man was only evil continually uh, before the flood came, the Lord was sorry, New King James. King James says, it repented the Lord that he had made man. What's God's reaction to sin? Uh, he's a little upset. The words that are used here is he was sorry. It repented God that he did this thing. Well, how do, you, how do you justify that with the idea that God 
says that he doesn't change. Let me, let me give you just a couple quick things. We don't have uh, time to deal with this in depth. First of all, we need to remember two important facts. We've already established them. The essence, nature, character, and will of God are immutable, stable, and perfect. That's what the Bible teaches. We've seen, and these are just two of the verses that taught that. Uh, if you go back and look at the notes, there's, there's over a dozen verses. But the Bible says that with God, there is no variation of turning. God's, God does not change. That's His essence, His nature, His character. That doesn't change. We need to remember that. Fact number two we need, we need to remember is the knowledge of God is perfect and complete. He knows everything that there is to know, past, present, and future. God doesn't learn anything. You ever thought about that? Did God, you know, did God go to school? Well, I never thought about that. He learned something today. You know, we say all the time, you know, it, you know, that there's opportunities for us to learn, and you learn something new every day. God doesn't. God doesn't discover things. He didn't go down to the bottom of the ocean and say, wow, look at these crevices down here. Maybe I'll tell Job to write about that. God, God didn't discover them. God knew they were there. God's never surprised by anything. If, if Hebrews 4 is right, and it says that everything is naked and open to the eyes of God, what would surprise him? If he sees everything and knows everything, you know, how are you going to surprise God? There's not going to be any surprises. Uh, Matthew 10, that's where it talks about uh, the birds in verse 30. His hundreds of prophecies and his, his eternal purpose proves this. If you read the prophecies of the Old Testament that were made hundreds and some of them thousands of years before they were ever fulfilled, what does that say about the knowledge of God? He knows things even before they happen. So put that, and we'll put it there in a minute, but put that in Genesis 6. Did God know that man was, was going to have thoughts only on evil continually before it happened in Genesis 6? Or was that a surprise to him? In Exodus 32, would, did it just blow God away and he never thought they would ever build a golden calf? Or did God know before it ever happened that it was going to happen? Let me, let me suggest two things to you. Uh, in this fact, number three, the Bible employs, it uses figurative language. Uh, it uses figures of speech, uh, old, and a, old and New Testament, to describe the infinite God to finite man. Uh, and it, it would have to, wouldn't it? Here's the infinite God, and, and here we are, finite man. How, how is God going to describe himself to us? How's he going to do it? He's going to have to come up with words that make sense to us that, that, are, that, that are comparable to him, but yet, how do, how do you use finite words to describe the infinite? How do you do that? You know, when, when God describes heaven, how does he describe it? What's the street made out of? You really think it's made out of gold or what, what is it, AU or what's the little thing on the... the whatever that thing's called. I don't even know what that thing's called. Pyramid of, what is it? Periodic table. Yeah, that thing too. Is it AU or AG or A something? AU. So is that, is that what the street's going to be made out of? I mean, have you read about, have you read about the heaven? Does God use figures of speech and figurative language to describe it to us in ways we would understand? And yet when we get there, is it going to be physical is it going to have these physical elements that our finite minds have imagined? Th th think about this in, in, in way of describing God. The Bible uses and attributes human or physical features to God. There's a two-cent word for you, anthropomorphism. That, that the Bible uses some physical words, physical features that we understand to describe God. Meaning, does God really have eyes? Does God really have ears? Does God really have hands? Does he really have arms? Does God really have a face? And the way that you and I think of a face, and, and the verse we had up there earlier about created all things with his fingers, the heavens with his fingers, does he really have, how many fingers do you think he has? I mean, we got 10, right? I mean, if God's really got fingers, how, how many fingers would you imagine the creator of this universe has? As many as he wants, right? So I mean, how many arms does he have? I mean, can you start to create in your little finite mind? Let's see. Unlimited arms, unlimited hands, unlimited fingers. Is that a scary looking creature to you? I mean, you, 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 could, you could go crazy with that. 
Why is the Bible using those terms to describe God? How many eyes does he have? Does he have eyes in the back of his head? Like, you know, like your mother did? Does he have eyes in the side of his head? Does God have a head? Does he have a face? The Bible uses accommodative language, doesn't it? To say, here's God. But is he limited by these physical elements? By these physical descriptions? No. It's the Bible saying, here's God to our little minds to help us to try to, to get a little, little piece of the infinite. And so the Bible describes these features, but the Bible says that God is spirit, right? How many, how many flesh and bones does a spirit have? Jesus says none. How many eyes, how many arms, how many fingers could a spirit have? None. So how do you mesh those two ideas together? He has arms, he has a face, he has eyes, he has ears, he has fingers. Oh, but he's a spirit. He doesn't have flesh and bones. How do you put those two together? Is that not contradictory? Pat? Pat? Yeah. Yeah. No, we we can't comprehend. Yeah. Pat 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 read Isaiah fifty five eight and nine about the thoughts of God and the ways of God. They're, they're not just different than ours. They are higher. They, they, they are so far superior to ours. And then she talks about just looking at the universe and looking at the images of the universe. And here we are, little old us, on this little old planet in this little old galaxy, you know, and, and there's, there, there's no way to even comprehend the magnitude of God. And yet that's what we're trying to do. You know, I thought you were going to say the verse you like in these cases, Deuteronomy 29, 29. That's not another, you know, that's not a bad one either. You know, the sacred things belong unto the Lord. and That's where we just ought to leave them, right? So here's God, says that he's a spirit and he doesn't have flesh and bones. And yet he has these, we don't have a problem with, we don't have a problem with that though, do we? We, we understand this is accommodative language to help us to see God. But not just anthropomorphism. Here's another word for you. Anthropopathism. You ever heard of that one? If the Bible ascribes physical features to God, then here, that, that's man form. Here's man feeling or man emotion where the Bible attributes human, not features or physical features, but human emotions and human feelings to God so that we might, here's eyes and ears and, and all of this so that we can, mm, we can sort of get an image of what God might be like. Well, could it also be the same thing with these emotions that we're reading about in some of these passages? When it says that God repented, that God was grieved, that God changed his mind or, or, or something like that. What is that? Is that accommodative language to us? Is it possible that's accommodative language to us? Is it possible that that's, that is God's way of describing to us just how upset he was by sin? See, to us, uh, when, when, when our child does something, uh, are we grieved by it? Sometimes we're surprised by it. Sometimes we're caught off guard. No, that can't be my child. That must be somebody else's child. Couldn't be mine. My, you know, mine would never do that. And we're caught off guard. But God already knows what we're going to do. So how could he be grieved by Genesis 6 and there being a sinful world when he knew it was going to be there? How could it grieve him? How, 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 could, he, how, how could he be, uh, how could he repent? How, how could he, you know, be sorry for, for making man if he already knew that that's where it was going to end up anyway? Here, here's language. Here's language that makes sense to us. Isn't that the reaction you would want from God where God would, would, would be sorry that he had made man? And yet in our minds, he already knew that that's what man was going to do. And so it seems that the Bible's using human, uh, human, that's the word, 
human terms to symbolically assert that man's conduct did not meet the divine standard. Did, did, did the conduct of man in Genesis 6 meet the divine standard? Were they doing what God wanted them to do? No. How does the Bible tell us that? God was sorry that he had made man and shows God's displeasure at man's rebellion. It doesn't show his surprise. It shows his displeasure. So can God change? Could it, if, if, God, if, God, if, God loves, if God loves someone, could God turn around and hate that same person? Would that be changing? If God hated someone, could he turn around and love that same person? Look, at, look in Jeremiah 18. What do we got, a minute and a half? Look in Jeremiah 18 real quick. We're not going to get to this last question, but I think this one was more critical. Jeremiah 18. This is the passage that talks about uh, the potter in the clay. Uh, Jeremiah 18. Uh, the Lord spoke. This is verse 5. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Jeremiah 18 and verse 6. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up, to pull it down, to destroy it. What is he saying? The instant that I speak about a nation, that I'm going to pluck it up, I'm going to pull it down, I'm going to destroy it. If, verse 8, that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. Is that God changing his mind? God says, I'm going to destroy this nation. Oh, they just turned from their evil. I won't destroy them. Oh, there's God. He just changed his mind. Well, keep reading. Verse 9. The, well, where am I? Yeah, verse 9. The instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to build it up and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I would said I would benefit it. Did God change his mind? Oh, I'm going to do good to that nation. They turned against him. I'm not going to do good to them anymore. Did God change his mind? Ah, God already had conditions set, didn't he? And all he's doing is staying true to his nature, to his eternal, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient, uh, omnipresent, to the conditions that he set for man, for his promises and the warnings that he made. And then it's man that falls into those conditions. God, has, God didn't change. When, when Abraham, I know the bell rang. When Abraham went to God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, what did Abraham want? God said, I'm destroying the city. And Abraham said, wait. What if I find 50? What if I find 45? What if I find 40? I won't destroy it. Why? Because there's righteous there. And God would not destroy the righteous. I'm going to destroy it. But sure, if you can find the righteous, I won't destroy it. Richard, you want to say something? Please do. Because I've learned some new words from that, and I appreciate that. Yeah. But changing his mind is not the same thing as changing his character. That's right. And he went there with Moses. Hezekiah asked for 15 more years and got that. Right. Ch changing, changing his nature is not the same thing as changing his mind. Uh, he, he talked about Moses, talked about Hezekiah getting 15 years. We, we've got to break this. Uh, but God has conditions set in place. Does he not? He didn't change his mind. Man changed what he was doing. And so God had to move from one condition to the other. Right now, I could be on that condition where God says David's going to go to heaven. But what if I change the course of my path? I change it. And now I'm over here and I could be David's going to hell. God didn't change I'm the one who changed. And God, staying true to his nature, true to his word, and true to his promises, ha had to keep those promises because of the, the choices that I made. All right, I, I hope some of that was helpful, especially the vocabulary lesson. We're going to break for just a minute and then uh, continue.